Good morning, men. <clears throat> We're going to get started this morning. Uh, I want to welcome you all to Wholehearted Men. I have a couple of announcements, then I'm going to introduce our guest speaker. My name is Jerry Forte. Um, we have two new table leaders today. Gordon Winslow is taking over table 42. And Sam Epperson is our newest table leader at table 49. Wow. All right. And just a reminder that breakfast is still $5. Isn't that amazing, right? And if you forgot to bring money, there's a QR code on the table attendance sheets you can use, and you can pay that way as well. And there's still some limited spots that are open for the Corey Asbury concert here at the road on April 1st. He wrote the song Reckless Love. Just want to encourage you, if you want to go to that concert, there are a few more spots that are still open for that. And you can sign up on the app. Um, it's now my distinct pleasure, um, if this gentleman could start making his way up, to introduce to you uh, Leo Goaz. I wanted to... Who? Oh! I wanted to give you some information about Leo that you may not know, um, that I happen to get from his wife. Um, <laughs> so Leo has a huge stamp and coin collection. It's kind of interesting. You wouldn't think that. Leo's favorite um, movie. Anyone want to guess? Titanic. Titanic, Toy Story, Rambo. Princess Bride, come on. Yeah, I like those, keep going. <laughs> Cinderella, no. His favorite movie is Sound of Music. He knows all the songs, he sings them with his grandchildren. Right. right, buddy? And, and of course, more than anything, Leo is a defender and a protector. And there's no one I would rather have watching my blind side than Leo go as. So, my bloodstained ally, Leo. Thank you. Thank you, Jerry. Can you hear me? Am I on? Whole heart! Live free! Whole heart! Live free! Well, welcome, you men. Um, welcome, first timers. This is a very special place that you just walked into. Uh, here in this building, we on Tuesday mornings, we grapple with the things regarding our masculinity and in an effort to walk wholeheartedly with the Lord, knowing that when we do walk wholeheartedly with the Lord, that's when we experience true freedom. Um, before, I, before I get started, can you guys join me in prayer? All our pastors are in the mountains at an advance. They've asked me to deliver the message today. And so but let's just pray and ask God to visit with us today. Heavenly Father, I just thank you for this day. I thank you for this day that you've created. Thank you for each man here for waking us up early this morning and getting us over here. Um, Father, I just pray for our pastors in the mountains right now. I just pray for a, a time of refreshing and a time of divine impartation from you as they um, continue to lead this church through all that's going on. So we honor you, we give you all the praise and glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So a few weeks ago, uh, I was happy to be in Hawaii watching this meeting here remotely from Hawaii. A good friend of mine and brother, uh, Paul Young. Paul, raise your hand real quick at table 21. He gave a pretty heartfelt message because I was planning on talking about so, to, something totally different, but the Lord kept on bringing me back to this. So out of, out of, I think the Lord wants to do more in this, in this regard. For those of you who weren't there uh, or heard the message, I'll kind of encapsulate it very quickly. Talked of, his, of his, wanting his father's approval, wanting intimate connection with his earthly father, but because of his father's own brokenness, could never get it, and how that in his adult years and leading into his uh, teenage and adult years, how that uh, affected his walk with the Lord as far as 
receiving sonship. And um, almost at times feeling, he used the word, feeling like an orphan. Uh, and he used this, this phrase, which, which I think is so true. Our childhood experiences set the stage. Then the enemy uses that stage to battle it out with God on whether or not he, God, is good or not. So my message today, I had a completely different upbringing, a completely different uh, experience with my father. And that's what I want to, so I, pers- I want to talk about that and how that affected me going into my adolescent and, and adult years. Um, so my title of my message, oh, title of my message is, Father's Heart, What is My Purpose? So here, here I am, I'm in college, I'm a sophomore there, uh, in, this, in this picture, I grew up, my father's in the middle, his name is Larry Goes, he was a, a son of an alcoholic father, my grandfather, and so my father at, at an early age determined in his mind that he was going to be the complete opposite of his father, and so he was the ultimate dad, he was, there's, there's me in the green sweats, my, uh, I'm a baby of eight kids. Uh, my old, all my older brothers were phenomenal athletes in high school, in little leagues, high school. I was the complete opposite. I was a clumsy, big, tall kid. But my father was the one that instilled a dream in me of, I think, in his own mind, he wanted one of his five boys to one day play in the NFL. Um, so he instilled a work ethic in me from a very young age um, that kind of overtook my life. Um, it fueled everything I did. He instilled this dream in me and he fed this dream whenever anything came in opposition of that dream. Here I am. So this is me, my senior year at the University of Hawaii. This was a pinnacle uh, time for me. This is my senior year. We just had be- this particular picture. We defeated a uh, overcame a 10-year losing streak to BYU, uh, beat them 40, 56 to 14. My dad happened to be on the field the whole game. The, the big problem with me, though, although I had this great experience with a great loving father who was there at every practice, every game, every, everything. I mean, he was just all in to his kids, uh, my, my four older brothers and my three older sisters. There was no godly mentoring. There was no godly impartation in that exchange, it was all work hard. You can do whatever you set your mind to. So I, over time, became a very uh, self-righteous, prideful person. And what I had done, not even realizing it, is I had made an idol out of my, out of, out of my earthly father. I did everything to gain his approval. Uh, and, and basically... The, the big thumbs up from him after, after, after a game. I wanted to make him proud. That was my sole goal in life. I could care less what my coaches thought. As long as dad said, hey, you, 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 you did a good job. That was all I needed to hear. An idol is the worship of something or someone other than God as though they were God. But on March the 3rd, 1990, had a radical salvation this is at uh, the conclusion of my senior year. Uh, my wife and I both in Hawaii uh, still had a lot of work to do in, in this regard. Um, my, step, my dad was still an idol in my life. I had not even, I hadn't dealt with that. That had kind of transferred right into being a born-again Christian. So a month later, I entered the NFL. So I, I ended up getting... Um, I ended up getting drafted to San Diego Chargers pretty early. Long story short, I ended up becoming a starter my rookie season at left tackle. Um, and so this is the very first game that my parents got to see me play. I was starting against the Raiders. I remember it like it was yesterday. They announced the offense. I ran out, I ran out in the announcements, had a great game. We were just closing on our first home. I'm 24 years old. Had this, getting this beautiful home in, in um, Rancho Bernardo, uh, San Diego. So we're, my parents and I and my wife are showing them around. And this is the, the day after this, this game. My dad 
and I had this amazing exchange in, in the garage of my car because I had to take off to go back to the stadium where my dad just breaks down in tears, uh, basically telling me how proud he was of me. And that ba- basically, if his life were to end today, he would, he would be fine. Um, how much this meant to him. So in tying this back, one other major point. On, on, so fast forward now to July 1991. This is like days before my second training camp with the Chargers. Um, had a phone call with my dad on June the 9th. Excuse me, July the 9th, 1991. Uh, it was the last conversation I had with my father, not even knowing it. He's in a YM in San Diego, training camps a week away. And five years, I mean, five hours later, I get the phone call from my brother. Dad passed away of a massive heart attack right at home at the age 62, right, right there in our home in Hawaii. So all this time, again, like I said previously, I'm seeking my, his approval. God actually showed me through a series of dreams of this place that I put my earthly father, uh, broke his heart, and that that is reserved only for him. So tying this back to Paul's message, where he had a complete opposite type of experience with his father, him feeling like an orphan, struggling with sonship toward God, whereas my battle of sonship was putting my earthly father in, in the place where, that is only reserved for God Almighty. So as you can see, in both instances, the enemy was at work, leading both of us down a path opposed to our Heavenly Father and his heart for us. We both desired our Father's approval, yet each of us in two opposite fatherly experiences. In either camp, we men fight in either camp, we men fight to find ourselves, we find ourselves in, we all must understand what the Father's heart is for us. So what is the Father's heart for us? To bring, to bring him glory in every aspect of life. We were created to glorify him and to bring him glory. God doesn't need us or the rest of creation for anything. Yet, we and the rest of creation glorify him and bring him joy. God did not create us because he was lonely or because he needed fellowship with other persons. God is absolutely independent and self-sufficient. Let, let me explain this. Uh, let me, well, let, let's just go through some scripture first. So Isaiah 43, 7 says, Everyone who is called my name, whom I have created, for my glory, I have formed him. Yes, I have made him. Ephesians 1, 11 through 12. In whom also we have attained an inheritance, being predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things, according to the counsel of his will, that we who first trusted in Christ should be the praise of his glory. 1 Corinthians 10.31, whether you eat, this is the, uh, at the end of a, uh, that, that chapter 10 where Paul is having this discussion regarding uh, our freedom in Christ, found in Christ. Whether you eat or drink, whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. And this last one, to me, says it all. Jesus, this is right before in, in Put it in in sports terms. This is right as Jesus is about to run out of the tunnel. I run it out of, out of a lot of tunnels. And, and when you're about to run out to a stadium of just adrenaline, and Jesus knew what was, this is right before he was going to go and get his body ripped open, knowing the price that he was about to pay. So Jesus spoke these words, lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your son that your son also may glorify you. And to the, to the point of God not uh, being independent, not really needing creation, but he, he, he chose to create, 
creation, the God who made the world and everything in it, being Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in temples made of man, nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all mankind life and breath and everything. This understanding determines the correct answer to the question, what is the purpose of life? Or our purpose, our purpose must be to fulfill the reason God created us, to glorify him. Thus lies the battle line, the battleground between the enemy of God, the enemy and God. Who will we worship? Who will be glorified? Every day, we as men especially are, are bombarded with all types of choices uh, as to what to do with our day. Countless people vying for our time and our attention, our families, our friends, our jobs, our hobbies. I have a lot of hobbies. Um, I, I love to do, um, I love to golf. Uh, these things all contend For my time and my affection, we often prioritize to do the most important things first off in our day. So my question is, where does spending time with God, where does that fall into your day? First in your day. I want to encourage everyone to dedicate that first morning time to the Lord and to spend time with him. To set your day on his leading. Ask the Holy Spirit to lead everything that you're doing for that day. This is something, again, it, it's a habitual, it, it's something that you have to do over a long period of time. Because if you're, if you're not doing it, you, it's, a, it's basically a, a reforming of habits. So I want to encourage you all to do that. This is, this is a, a, this next point is to, to live life with the understanding that this here is not our home. That we are just passing through. Steve, Pastor Steve used, I believe it was last week or the week before, uh, the terminology, this is like training camp. I can totally relate with that. I've been through a lot of training camps. And in training camp in the NFL, you get a stipend per week, like Back then when I was playing in the 90s, it was six, seven hundred 700 bucks a week. And you're like getting your body trashed. You go through all that to make the team, get the jersey, be a part of the team, to get all the benefits of being on the team. And the, the benefits obviously were the, the big fat paychecks every week. Um, but this is training camp. God Almighty sees everything that's going on in this world. Nothing catches them by surprise. He is using the schemes and plans of the enemy to accomplish his divine plan. So question. Oh. Let me see where we are at. So how do we how do we glorify him? First off, if you haven't done so, which I'm assuming everyone or most, but there could be a few in here not that haven't. It all starts with the Lord Jesus Christ. We must repent of our sins and accept him as our, as our Lord and Savior. You can't glorify the Father without first being cleansed of your sins by the Son. You, this is something you can do right at your table. John 14, 6 says, I'm the way, the truth, and the life that no one comes to the Father but by me. This is Jesus uh, talking about himself. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, for it is by grace you have been saved through faith and not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, not a result of works that any man should boast. And Romans 10, 9 and 10, if we confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. For with the heart man believes resulting in righteousness, and with the mouth he confesses resulting in salvation. So if that's step number one, that's, that's just the very beginning. Secondly, 
Start getting into God's word daily. This is something that Pastor Steve constantly is reminding us of, and that's something that uh, if it wasn't for this church, I would be in a totally different place because I was in a season of being in the desert. And until I established this one was where I, where I saw the big turnaround. I would say start in the Gospels. If you're not doing it, start in the Gospels is a pretty good place to start. Or in uh, Psalms and Proverbs is also a good, a, a good book to go through. Here in, at this church, we're privileged to have some really brilliant people. I would recommend this book if you, if you haven't. Uh, this is written by Jay Inman, uh, a good brother here at this church that is basically a, a, a go through the Bible in a year. Um, Romans 10, excuse me, Romans 12, 1 and 2, I beseech you, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, so that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service, and do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. The enemy's main battleground is here to get control of here. And so if you're not filling yourself daily in here with God's truth and God's promises, uh, you don't have a chance. You have zero chance. Um, Hebrews 4.12, for the for the word of God is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit of both joints and marrow and is the discerner in, of the thoughts and intents of the heart. It, it's all, this is, the, this is the, what, what the enemy wants. He wants our heart to be devoted to him. Number three, find a good local church. Uh, we would welcome you at the road if you don't have one. We would embrace you with open arms. Um, this is a very special, unique place. I've never quite been to a church like this, and I thank God every day for this church. Become a disciple, number four, become a disciple of Jesus. Most local churches have one. I know we do here. Um, but it's all about discipleship. It's not get saved and then go, okay, you got like a, a life insurance policy and go about your life. No, it's being discipled in the word, being discipled in the life of Jesus and trying to emulate that in our, in our own lives. Fifthly, keep coming to wholehearted men. This, is a, this has been a, a godsend for me. Um, prior to COVID, I was doing the back and forth to Hawaii. I work out of Hawaii. My branch, I'm in the financial investment world. My branch sits right in the middle of downtown Honolulu. And every month I was doing the back and forth thing. 60% there, 40% here. How many of you know that's not good for married life? So until I, and then fast forward to COVID, Hawaii shut down. And I've been able to stay here pretty much the whole time and work remotely. And We've had our best years in 2020, 2021, um, all to the glory of God. So this one here, bloodstained allies, never heard that concept before, but it's so true. We as men need other men in our lives because that's a gift of God to walk through life together and that um, we're not meant to be lone rangers. So I give my props to my boys here at table 13. Give it up for table 13, man. We, we, we get after it every Tuesday. We get, we get down to some pretty sensitive topics, but that's what it's all about. It's about being real. I mean, I, another term I never heard before too, I stepped foot in this church is don't be a poser. I was a huge poser for a lot of years. I played in the NFL. You get really good at posing and being in the NFL because it's all about material stuff and houses and cars and blah, 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 blah. And um, so I had, I had become a poser. I didn't even realize I was one. But until I heard that term, it's like, wow, I, am, I have been a poser. Not until I got around in a, in a small table like this and I could trust men with the deepest secrets of my heart and let it out there, 
um, was I able to be free of it, to be free of the shame and um, all that goes with it. Number six, this is a huge one. Live your life with the knowledge that we're passing through this earth. This is not our home. This is a training ground for us. We, we talk often in this church about having a kingdom of God revolution. Well, in order to have a kingdom of God revolution, you first have to have a kingdom mindset. In order to have a kingdom mindset, you have to be in his word. You have to be around people who are kingdom-minded. And so um, we're going to see that happen in our, in, our, in, our, in our time here on this earth but to live again with a mindset that this is not our home. We, we just we had an amazing message. Those of you who don't go to the road, and this, I just, God just dropped this in my spirit as I was driving here this morning. We talked about this Sunday. I think it was one of the few pulpits in the country talking about the Great Reset. Uh, talking about the Great Reset and all that's behind, all the deception, all the lies, all the, the desire of the, the world leaders that run that are being controlled really by the enemy. But how many of you know that God, so Steve, Pastor Steve, if you're listening, how many of you know that God has his own reset plan? And if you, and his reset plan is found if you just read through Revelation, especially in Revelation 21, God's reset plan is he's, he's, he's going to, he, he says in, in Revelation 21.1, about, in fact, I'm just going to read it to you real quick. I think, it's, I think it's worth it. But this is a bonus. It's not even in my notes. <laughs> this is pretty powerful. This is God's reset. He's going to reset. Oh, 21 one. Sorry. Sorry, guys. Talking about a new heaven and a new earth. Romans 20, I mean, excuse me, Revelation 21.1. This is John on the island of Patmos. And I saw a new heaven and a new earth. The first heaven and the first earth had passed away. Also, there was no more sea. So this is all going to be, God's going to redo everything. And are we going to be a part of that new, that new thing that he's doing all that gets to be decided here on this earth, that's the training ground part, is we have to decide who are we going to serve, who are we going to worship, who are we going to glorify. And lastly, men, teach this to your world, the world, but meaning your world, where you work, where you live, where you go. But start off with your family first. Because if we're not doing it in, our, in the four walls of our home, then um, I think that's our first ministry. That's our first calling. That's, our, that's the initial calling that we need to lead our wives, lead our children, lead our grandchildren. I'm a grandfather of soon-to-be seven kids, and really forming their wor uh, worldview and giving them uh, a godly perspective on things. So in wrapping up, I have just some, some quick questions for you guys to discuss at your table. If you, there's one takeaway I would like for you to take away from this morning is this is not our home. This, if we live with the mindset that, that we're passing through this earth and filter every decision, every circumstance, everything that comes our way through that lens, um, God will use us in ways that we can't even imagine. So, Father, I just, I thank you for these men. I thank you for, I know a bunch of them here, and I'm so inspired by so many of them. They, they, they charge me in ways that um, are so amazing. So, Father, I just pray that you would 
speak to each of us individually as to situations and circumstances that we're walking through right now. Some are pretty dark and some are intense. Father, you're the God that created all things and there's nothing, nothing too big for you. And even as we live through these, these crazy times, Father, there's nothing that go, goes on that catches you by surprise. You literally use the enemy and you use the puppets. You use the, the leaders of this, of this world that think they're leading as, as your puppet. So, Father, have your way in each of our lives. Be glorified in, in all that we do. Teach us how to do that. Teach us how to die of ourselves on a daily basis, to die to our, our families, to um, put your interest ahead of ours, Father. Because at the end of the day, when we do see you face to face, that's what we're going to be doing anyway. We're going to be worshiping, glorifying your, you at the throne. So prepare us, prepare us in these times that we live in for that. And it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. So Zachary, Zachary, where are you, Zachary? Crane. Thank you, guys. So first time, thank you. So first time, Zachary's going to take you over to the library, and um, he's going to kind of give you, answer questions, and, and tell you more details about what we do here at, on Tuesday morning. But love you guys. Whole heart! Live free! Whole heart! Live free! All right.